Nice shirt. What's up? shirts like in places like Dylan's and Neiman Marcus and it's the kind of shirt you go, that's beautiful and you look at the price tag and go, ha 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 but you walk into their store and it's like everything is extremely colorful and like really loud and not, not obnoxious, but definitely something you wouldn't wear to a funeral. <laughs> Unless it were my funeral, in case I wouldn't ever would dress like this. <laughs> not anytime soon. <laughs> but uh, but it, like it's kind of like being bird cage. Like, this is amazing. <laughs> Clothes help you grow into being an older gay man. <laughs> because you run out of options. As you get older, you're like, I can't wear that anymore. I'm not the right phase of my life to get away with those chaps. <laughs> you didn't need to know that about me. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? <laughs> I mean, how are we doing? Hi. 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 Welcome to my Q&A. Uh, I guess it's been a year or two since I've been to Akon. How are you guys feeling about the new venue? It's kind of swing. I kind of like it. Woo! It's very expensive. Yeah. Everything around here is expensive. Like yeah. It's kind of cool and downtown Fort Worth. Not that downtown Dallas is bad, but I live in downtown Dallas, so it's like, oh, it's kind of cool, but I mean, I'm going to go. Sorry, I didn't know how it is. This is funny, because how many people are from here, like from <laughs> Texas? Like, Texas like, how many out of towners, like out of state? Woo! <laughs> now, okay, honestly, just give me kind of a general sense. Those of you out of state, are you a little terrified of being here? Because, like, if you go to Dallas or Austin or Houston, they're kind of, I don't say generic cities, but they're not what people that don't live in Texas think about being Texas. They're like, I just got back from Yorkshire, England last weekend. They're like, oh, you're from Texas. So everyone wears like cowboy hats and rides horses to what they really believe. <laughs> we don't actually. Most of us can't ride horses. We might have seen one somewhere in a circus, but you know, you know, this is our pet horse. We eat with them at the table. Like, it's not. Like, <laughs> So it's like Dallas, they're more metropolitan. It's more like any big city. It's like you get a, little, it's a nice melange of people and types and sorts of big styles. But here in Fort Worth, I feel is the most Texas feeling large city. Because like, yeah. I'm in a hotel room with a couch made out of cow. <laughs> Not even leather. I don't feel it's that process. It's just, it was a cow that passed away, and they decided we could use this. Lord of the Plains. Um, so we're like, this is very Texas. That's like, Fort Worth is what people think of when they think of Texas. Uh, so uh, that's just a very long way of saying, welcome, any of you who have never been here before. Like, this is crazy. Uh, I saw Louis Wainwright, a song, singer songwriter who I had worked play here a few years ago, and he'd never been to Fort Worth before, and he was like, yeah, I always like to have a certain picture in my head of every city I play, and in Fort Worth, all I can think is, you guys doing awful things to cattle. <laughs> And you're like, it's true. It's true. Um, anyway, I'm rambling. So how many of you have been to a panel of mine before? I don't know why you're back. <laughs> you're a fat chick made of so three years ago. I'll keep track. Uh, so let me lay down a couple ground rules before we get started. This is a family friendly panel. I realize there are all kinds of families. But if we can keep it PG-13, that would be nice. Um, ish. <laughs> Look at someone making a mark of ish. We'll go ish. I have a full on PG-13. We'll go ish. That's as much as you get to take them. <laughs> so it's Q&A. So how this works is you bring the Q and I bring the A. If you don't know what that stands for, ask the person next to you. Um, and and uh, the only thing I ask is, is please, this is not the time to ask me for an autograph. That's a different thing altogether. This is a, it's a weird setting to do an autograph. Like, excuse me, everyone, while I have this, you know, moment. Uh, also, for the love of God, don't ask me to call your friend. Because I won't do it. Screw them, they should be here. <laughs> right? They should be here. You put in the work and the legwork, you wait in line, they don't get to see me. Mm -hmm. This is just for us. 
But also, there's nothing more awkward than watching me on the phone with someone who doesn't know who they're talking to. And that's always how it happens. Like, your friend's like, oh my gosh, she's going to love hearing your voice. And I hear this, hi. And then we talk for a minute, and they're like, who are you? <laughs> and I'm like, well, this is a humbling experience. Who <laughs> me? I don't know. I'm going to give your phone back. Uh, so this is just one of those, if you ask me a question, then I answer. Uh, also, like, so I frequently get asked, what's my favorite, insert, word and thing here, show, character, color, piece of clothing, ice cream, um, season. Like, I've been asked all of that. Um, please don't ask me my favorite anything. I can't stress this enough. I hate the favorites game. <laughs> Let me explain why. So, I, I most often get asked who's my favorite character, and at this point in my career, I have played over 200, and they're all family to me. Like, I'm a little crazy. Most actors are. So all of my characters, even like Soldier B, who, like, said freeze and got shot and died. Like, to me, that's well. He has a family. <laughs> I connected with him for those two minutes. I was in the mood playing that character. So if I were to be like, oh, my favorite character, because I want to answer your awesome question, I'd be like, my favorite character is Will Lawrence from Spice and Wolf, or Sebastian or Kilia, and everyone screams and whatever. I go back to my room, and all these characters that are still in there, in my head, talking to me constantly, right now, as I'm speaking to you, would go, you're a bastard. <laughs> I would be favorite. <laughs> but I've learned to avoid the favorites game. Even like, even if they, other things, like, what's your favorite? I'm like, I don't know. Someone asked me, like, pick two movies you would love to watch on a desert island. And I'm like, uh. <laughs> if I was trapped on a desert island, I wouldn't be thinking, what do I want to watch on a desert island? I think you get me the hell out of here. Um, but I can all I can do is have Lawrence of Arabia and something else? I don't know. So I have a really hard time like rating my experience of things, as you may know. So the favorites game, please don't ask that. Come up with something more creative. I like creative questions. Uh, also, if you've watched a YouTube video of me giving one of these talks before, or been to one of my talks before, and, and you know the answer to the question you want to ask, don't ask it. Ask <laughs> something else. We're voice actors. We can ask the same questions every day of our lives. <laughs> and after a while, we just kind of go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to laminate, like, get a laminate card of all the answers, like, this is how you become a voice actor. This is my, this is what it was like for Gordon Corset scene. This is what it was like. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Pass them all day. Everyone take your hand out. Thank you. Now ask me something. Not on the sheet. <laughs> I'm becoming such a grumpy old man. <laughs> like, what was it like? Eh, hey, get off my lawn. <laughs> Uh, if you are interested in, in asking more risque questions, and you are old enough, that is to say, over the age of 18, feel free to come to my WTF 101 panel this evening, which is uh, me getting really saucy. <laughs> Another thing I should add, I do get a little salty in these panels sometimes. I mean it in love, it's just my shtick. I'm like, I'm like your, I'm like your favorite English substitute teacher. I'm like, oh, that's wonderful, I believe in you. Give me the gum. <laughs> That's, that's kind of the role I, I found myself playing, so if I pick on you or make fun of you or something, it's all in good fun. Please don't take it personally. I honestly do love you. I'm just kind of an asshole. <laughs> all right. Thanks for coming. That's all the time I have. Um, who wants to start off with a good question? Also, please don't feel offended by if you have your hand the entire time I never pick you. It's just because I, it's not that I don't love you, I just don't mind to use you. So... <laughs> Um, I'm just wondering, what was it like to dub the live action of Black Butler, and what were your thoughts on it? Oh my god, your phone's going on. I'm so embarrassed for you. <laughs> I'm to turn mine off. <laughs> Come on. Uh, so what was it like uh, dubbing the live action Black Butler movie? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I thought it was fun because I got to come in last and everyone else had already kind of laid down their recordings and so I got to play off of everyone else, Brina and everyone else uh, had already kind of been in and spent a couple of weeks doing it so I had to come in and just sort of like tie it all together. Because Ian was like, you know, it's just missing Sebastian, that's all we need. I'm like, oh, it's fun. <laughs> it's weird doing the live action, it just feels different. I mean, it's it's cool, it's still it's still a black butler we know and love, it's just kind of a different iteration of it, but it's interesting seeing uh, you know, live action actors playing it. And when you're so, I mean, I've been playing Sebastian now for eight years uh, over the course of, of the seasons that have been coming out. So it's, and I'm very used to a very particular style and music and all that, and seeing it done live action is a little jarring at first. Like jumping into, you know, a pool of water that was colder than you would expect. And after a while, you're like, oh, this is nice. The first, the first moment is, ah! <laughs> it was weird because I'm so used to a particular set of, a particular style of animation that uh, when it was live action, I'm like, oh, this is really hard. But there was just something about the actor who played, whose name I can't remember, 
at the moment. Somebody knows it and will tell me, I'm sure. But uh, so the actor who played Sebastian in the live action looks great. I mean, he's you know he's got the he's got the mannerisms down, and he sort of does the, the eyebrow thing. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, it's really, really, really cool. And so I kind of got it was really funny. We're like, how are we going to do this? Am I going to have to change my voice to make to have it make a little more sense with his physical presence? Because there it, it, it is a strange you know there's a disconnect there possibly. But we started doing it like, oh my god, it works. It totally works, guys. <laughs> Speaking of movies, the Hollywood Atlantic is coming out. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> Can you see on the big screen? I'm like, that's me up there in the movie, Mom. The <laughs> Hollywood Atlantic is really, really cool. So I hope all of you get a chance to, to see it at some point because I love. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and preemptively answer that question because someone may ask it later. My, my, like the for me the best part about that movie is Lizzie. Lizzie in that yeah. movie. Oh my gosh, she's such a badass. <laughs> like up till now, she's kind of been purposely one of the most annoying characters in the entire show. She's like, nah, 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 nah. and she's hysterical, but she's like, oh my god, if I was with, was, was with you for more than five minutes in real life, one of us would die. <laughs> but you see this whole other side of her in the Book of Atlantic, which is like, oh my god, that's brilliant. Oh, and Jeremy just kills it, just nails it. She's oh, brilliant. Jeremy's one of my, my best friends, and like I love her acting. It's just on point. I don't even remember your question anymore, I'm just rambling. <laughs> I've got another question. You. Uh, when you're working on adaptation, do you write for your, like, and if, you're, if, you're, if you're writing adaptation, you know you're going to be voicing in, do you write the characters you play any differently than like, everybody else? So here's the secret of how I get so much work. <laughs> I will write a show and be like, oh, there's a character with glasses. <laughs> Use a few big words. I, I honestly believe that half of my career has just been like, Tatum, get Tatum, and no one else knows how to say this. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I just use the word obsequious. <laughs> it's really awesome to go into an audition uh, for a show that you wrote and then come out and be like, go home, bitches, I nailed it. <laughs> uh, so no, I, I don't consciously do that. I, I will frequently forget about like when I'm uh, when you're writing you kind of act for all the characters that you're uh, doing especially with the uh, dub adaptation one of the things you have to do is to sort of make sure that it can be performed so you have to like focus on your breath like so you'll write a line and be like okay now I have to deliver it to make sure that a human being can actually do this in the time allotted because it's it's different than doing prelay where you can kind of where they animate around your performance uh, or any other kind of acting like you have a very specific set of words you have to say and a very specific set of flaps with a very specific intent and it's, it's just very, everything has to be very focused and, and very myopic. And uh, so if you write a line that's just a little too long, or maybe it has a flat too long or a flat too short, or maybe in your head, oh yeah, that would totally fit, but you don't account for, oh, actually the screen is, you need a lot more breath, which takes more time to say, so these words won't actually fit in this flap or whatever. So you have to perform it. Uh, and you end up, <laughs> I've written many a script on a plane, which makes me look crazy. <laughs> it's really fun to try to explain to the person next to me what I'm doing when I'm like, <laughs> and the next character, you look like a total psychopath. Right? Like my dog at home watches me like. And now, whenever I can, I'll actually vocalize it as loudly as possible, which is which is the great thing about you know, working freelance is you're not in an office where people are like, what's going on there? <laughs> Uh, so I don't ever consciously write myself into a show. It, it happens that I, I just felt they might ask me to be in it because they're like, hey, you know, we have a quick turnaround time on this, and so we don't have a lot of time to record it. And since you wrote it, you're probably gonna, you know, you're you're gonna need very little. Uh, there's very little downtime, so you can just come in and kind of hit the ground running because you wrote the, the script. So that happens frequently. But I've also I write a lot, and so uh, more of averages, I'm gonna end up being in something. I, I hate being the lead in something I've written. Uh, anyone here seen Steins Gate? Yeah. Woo! Awesome. Yeah. Steins Gate was one of those shows where I'm like, I loved it. Writing it with Patrick Seitz, who's one of my favorite human beings on the face of the planet, um, it was like deeply rewarding experience because I just loved the characters. I loved everything about it. And I was like, oh my god, here's a character. Oh, wait, the lead. I'm like, oh, you can do anything with him. Like anything, because he's just so huge and over the top and so complex that I'm like, anything would work. And I would find myself like, this was months before I, it, they auditioned for it. I would be typing a line going, hey, no, I'm going to be the poor bastard that has to pre-fly with this. Good luck, I'm making a challenge for you. Oh, it's a new shit. So it's actually kind of stressful when you're actually working in the booth on a show that you've written because you've got no one to blame but you. I'd be like, who wrote this? Oh, I did, never mind. I'm making it work. I'm making it work. Give me another 
gonna say, it's fine. I know, I, I know what I was going for. I remember now. It's really stressful. The director's looks at you like, yeah, just wait until you figure it out. Still got another quiz. Purple. Um, I heard that you met Sea Dog recently. How was that? Sea <laughs> Dog. Does everyone know who Sea Dog is? <laughs> C-Dog is a YouTuber who does like a lot of voices and he loves doing Sebastian's voice and prank calling people. <laughs> He's actually British, so we kind of have an advantage. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I see, to me, Sebastian's an accent. To you, it's just Tuesday. Uh, which is, but he was, he was super, like, cool, like, nicest guy, and, and, uh, he was really nervous about meeting me, because he's like, oh, yes, I was talking to you, was and I'm like, wow, you sound really good, and, and he was like, oh, well, you know, I actually did this, and I'm, I knew who he was by reputation, and I'd seen, um, a video of him in which his voice was featured, but not his face, so I didn't recognize him to see him, but when he started talking, I'm like, you sound, oh, I'm a little threatened right now. <laughs> Uh, but he was he was wonderful. So I was uh, I was I mentioned earlier I was in uh, Yorkshire, England last weekend where he had gone and we met. So we did drinks and dinner together, just kind of talk about about stuff. And it's it's weird. I meet a lot of people in this business who think they can do my voice, and I'm always a little disappointed. I'm like, what do I sound like? <laughs> and they go, blah, 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 blah. but I'm like, I don't sound like that. <laughs> You're terrible, but you have to go, oh, that's good. <laughs> Not friends at all. Then he comes along, he's like, and just his normal voice. He's like, hello, I'm like, oh. He was like, yes, I was just wondering, like, you know, I was like, I'm thinking one day to sort of come to the States and maybe you'll try it for a bit. No, don't. <laughs> don't do that. 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 Don't it was so weird. So the thing is, I'll tell the story too because it kind of reminds me. So the thing about Sebastian is Sebastian speaks with what's called a received pronunciation accent. It's not how people speak over in England. It's it's a learned, it's a trained accent. Like no one, there's there's like a thousand different accents in England depending on where you go. It's like we were in Yorkshire last weekend where they're like, hello! And I'm like, imagine, you know, Sebastian does not sound like a Londoner. A Londoner would be like, you know, yes, my lord. <laughs> Different feels, sound like more like Michael Caine's Alfred. <laughs> different tone. Um, but so that received pronunciation is like the royals speaking it, you know, and the politicians speaking it. It's, you go to finishing school and learn it, you know, the rain is painful, the pain, sort of thing. <laughs> no one is born with that accent. Just like very few people are born with what we in the States call the sort of neutral uh, news anchor accent, you know, like, oh, tonight at 4 o'clock. Like, that person's real accent is probably like, tonight at 4 o'clock. <laughs> Because they go for one in the show and it's uh, it's, uh, in broader markets, right? Just a weird thing. So it was funny. I was really nervous about going to England and meeting all of these people. That I'm like, I'm an American, basically making fun of you as a for a career. <laughs> but they love it because I'm like, oh, no, we don't actually speak like that. We, we just, you know, it's just, it's, it's, this is sort of like a posh accent. No one really uses it anymore unless you like, you know, politics or something. So no, it's fine. It's not like we're offended by that. We think it's grand. And I'm like, thank God. <laughs> Uh, but the accent, oh my god. So here's the thing that happens when you find yourself traveling to other countries uh, to do cons, which happens on occasion. You're like, wow, they, you watch the devil over here? Weird, cool, awesome, thank you for having me. And in England, it was really stressful because I'm like, I'm actually here and everything is Sebastian special. I'm like, oh, they're gonna judge me for the accent. I was like, I was prepared for a bunch of British people to like line up on my autograph line just so they could slap me. <laughs> like one after the other, like, oh, that must be you, bang! <laughs> So I, but I, the accent in Yorkshire is kind of middle England. It's like not quite northern. Northern is almost impenetrable. It kind of leads into like Scottish, Irish, and more north you go, and that has its own music to it and its own slang and their own words. Sometimes you're like, that's that's barely English anymore. <laughs> But like, you know, Manchester and Yorkshire and Sheffield, like that's kind of like middle of the ground. So they have, you know, that's recognizable, but sometimes, you know, there are some people that have really thick accents. So they come inside, they come up to your to your table and they say, and then, you know, they ask you to make something out of who's can you sign this to her? <laughs> and you don't want to be rude and go, what? <laughs> 
And I'm like, I'm not sure. And I go, ah, can you spell that for me? I just want to make sure I spell it right. I'm not sure I'll spell it. Spell it. Thinking that'll get you out of it. And what you hear is, ah, yeah, sure. A pitch, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like, could you write it down for me? There was a lot of writing down. I'm like, oh, this is perfectly good. And you find out they're saying, oh, Heather, Heather. Oh, Heather. They're like, oh, Heather. I'm like, you're right, it's Heather. <laughs> I'm just so making up. They were delightful. Uh, okay, next question, next question before I make more of an ass of myself. Uh, you and the red in the corner there. It's like a, you've got the little spiky. Yeah. yeah. So during the charity auction, when you kissed the corn, did you use Tom or Dickie? Oh, I used Tom. Um, yeah. Man, I can I just say the year before at that same con, I kissed Jerry Jewel. <laughs> and he didn't back away. <laughs> There's a man securing his heterosexuality. He's like, oh, this is for charity, whatever. And I'm like, oh, awesome. <laughs> you, sir, are an ally. <laughs> Ian was a little, I was just like, Ian. <laughs> he was so much fun. Like, Ian was like, we're kissing? I'm like, come on, we've known each other forever. We knew this was going to happen someday. <laughs> but like, you see him, and he's just like, pit me. Like, ah. <laughs> Do not want. I'm like, it's for charity. I didn't actually use Tom, that would have been gross. <laughs> I mean, not because it's Ian, but because I'm like, do you talk about someone that clearly isn't enjoying himself? I'm like, you know, like, at what point do you go, oh, he's not into this. You know what'll work? Tom, that'll win him over. That'll win him over. Yeah. We're just one of those mm, kisses, you know, like a stage kiss. Uh, it was for you in the back, standing up, yes. Sebastian, I think you would look around and be like, hmm, amateurs. <laughs> Actually, I think he would be, he probably would he kind of ignore them and be more focused on the gorillas. Like, oh, that's a girl. I see it all the time, I see you. Thank God, can I just say how fortunate I am to have been involved in Black Butler? Because now, and this is what happens when you've gone to concert for a while on a show that popular. My peripheral vision is now keyed into certain colors. <laughs> I'm like, I see red, there's a grill about five yards that way. <laughs> yep, you know, I see pink, there's a cross player, CL. Yep, and it's so funny. I'm like, but now, right, I can, tell, I can see you through the wall. <laughs> I developed, like, that show has such a wonderfully vibrant color palette, despite being called Black Butler, um, that it's, you, you wonderful cosplayers, you think you could be sneaky. <laughs> I can see you before you even know I'm in the room. Let's talk about that for a second. Though. You know my big trick? I'm not wearing my glasses today, right? And this is something I, I don't wear my glasses all the time anymore because my doctor suggested I don't. Uh, and I don't wear contacts because my prescription is getting less, lesser, I guess, because I get older and my eyes are improving, which is weird. <laughs> I'm not complaining, so it's weird. Right? But my glasses for the long time are how people recognize me because I played a lot of characters that wore glasses. Megane, they're called. And I also just became kind of like my brand. And so I'm like, oh, I should wear my glasses. Well, I learned a lesson at a con. I'm like, I'm going to go to the dealer's room. And I just took my glasses off. No one recognized me. <laughs> I'm like, it was that simple. I'm like six foot four. And I didn't exactly dress down. <laughs> so I'm going to go like, and I could go right by somebody and be like, no. <laughs> I'd be interviewing with someone and take my glasses off and be like, whoa, where'd Tatum go? What up? Hi, how are you? Like, it's, it's just so funny. Like, if people, like, they don't think they see the glasses. That's all they see. It's like reverse Superman. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what is the greatest prank that Brina has ever pulled on you? <laughs> the greatest prank Brina has ever pulled on me? Uh, it's breaking into my house and rearranging my furniture. <laughs> And then letting me think for six hours that some crazed fan had done it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if anyone knows the story, uh, so I'll tell it. So years ago, I used to live in Arlington, which was just up the road in a house. I was like, oh, yeah, wow. Um, another little house, you know, it's fine. Me and my partner at the time uh, had together, and <laughs> we'd gone out to dinner, and then uh, Rita, who lived in Dallas, you know, so she didn't come to Arlington that often, like called me, be like, hey, I'm in town, but I got her voicemail, and I, I didn't get it until we were pulling up in the driveway after we finished eating dinner. 
And uh, I get this this message from like, hey Tatum, like we're in town, we just want to say hi. Like I couldn't remember where you live. Like you, you want to like go get drinks or something? And I'm like, oh, I'll call when we get in the house. And I notice as I like go to unlock the door that like the bolt isn't like the deadbolt isn't locked, just the just the little button lock, you know, which you can lock on the inside and pull the door shut. And I'm like, that's weird. I remember. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Why is there no couch over here? <laughs> Why is the chair, why is the... There was a five dollar bill on the couch with a note on it that said, We have fun, thanks. <laughs> and my first thought was, Brina! So I called her up, and I'm like, Brina, what the hell? Why were you in my house? Why did you get in my house? And Brina is such a consummate actress that I completely, she totally, totally sold me on the idea that it could not possibly have been her. She was like, no, that's we no, we're like we're, we didn't know we don't I had to call you to find out where you live. I don't know where your house is anymore. I'm living there once. It was like three years ago. Oh my god, what happened? And I'm like, no, it wasn't her. <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna figure it out, I'll call you back. Oh, weird. Okay, so I'm like trying to call several friends who I'm convinced it has to be, and all of them have airtight alibis. And I'm like, somebody's broken in my house. <laughs> Somebody has broken into my house. <laughs> And done, uh, like, they've not even stolen anything. They've done something even weirder. They rearranged their furniture. Why would they do that? I'm like, there's a clown with an axe hiding in a couple of days. I know it, I know it. I'm not sleeping here today. We're moving, we're moving. And I had this experience, and my, my partner was like, calm down, it's, it's bound to be someone that's prank a prank, we just haven't figured out who yet. It's someone we know, because we know where we live, it's whatever. Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay, right, calm down, calm down, fine, fine, fine. After being like, no, we must! Finally, ready and keel. And decided to go there to the freezer for the refrigerator. And I opened up, and there's a six pack of beer. That I don't, I'm not much of a beer person, so I'm like, that that wasn't in here yesterday. <laughs> I open up the freezer on a whim, and there is my favorite brand of ice cream with my name on it, <laughs> like written in like psycho, like. <laughs> and I'm like conversation to have with a police officer who has no idea or cares who you are. They're like, well, no one took anything. But like, you don't understand, I'm like, I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> and one thing, the thing is, like, not long before that, like, had been Halloween. And this is a true story, and if you're here, I just want you to know how close you came to know where I live. But we had trick-or-treaters, right? All the time, and I never thought about, it, thought nothing about shutting the door and handing people candy, because it's trick-or-treat, Halloween, whatever. I have this big little candy, the doorbell rings at like 9 o'clock at night. And I go open it up, and there are two Black Brother cosplayers, bitch you please, right on my front porch, like about probably in their late teens. And they look smashing, they look great, but one of them is dressed as like Ciel in the dress, and the other one's dressed as Sebastian. And I go from like, hey, hi! <laughs> and I go into like, I immediately go, like, my first instinct is to do what I would do. Come back, hello. I'm like, I can't do that, I can't do that, don't do that, don't do that. So my mind goes, flips to Texas. And I'm like, well, how y'all doing? Y'all should be like, And, and they like looked at me like I was insane, like, um, we're from a show called Black Butler, and I'm Sebastian, and she is there. And I'm like, well, that sure does look adorable. We all have to have out with this candy. We all have to be safe now, close the door. So that happened just like maybe a year before Brina just had a creepy crawl in my house. <laughs> So, the, and the cop is like, I don't, it's probably, you don't want to write a report because then I have to arrest whoever it is, and it's probably someone you know. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and Brita will tell the story and say like, but she called me back like an hour later. No, she fell asleep. <laughs> and called me back like four, five, six hours later, and she didn't just go, it was me, she did this. She, uh, I pick up the phone, still like, unable to sleep, like shaking, eyes wide, red. <laughs> Yeah. Did you ever figure out who did it? No, no. I had the police here, and I was, I don't know. It's just, I don't know what to do. I'm kind of freaking out right now. I think I want to spend the night at the hotel. I just, I feel really weird. She's like, well, did they, okay, I have a weird question. Did they, like, leave anything in your fridge or your freezer? And I'm like, yes. They, like, left a pint of, like, my ice cream and then, like, beer. And she was like, oh, my God. <laughs> Someone did the same thing to me. And I'm like, oh, my God, we're all going to die. Someone did the same thing to me. 
that's their way of playing with this. And Rena just lets me freak out for five minutes. She's like, it's me, dumbass. I'm like, oh. I tried to get her back, but I'm really bad at pranking people. I tried to get her back at the con, long story, it just fell flat. She wound up pranking me at the con even worse. Because she's like, well, they're gonna get me back, and I'm an overachiever, so it's on. And she wound up like getting me on stage and saying, and, like, here come the clowns. Or sitting the clowns to me, like on my own terrifying version. She wrote just for me. Who oh, was <laughs> you? Um, so this is, this is, if I can speak like this, I have to do it over a moment. Uh, I've come to learn that there is no such thing as the character. Like, they, they are just different facets of our own personalities. And one of the things you learn, the craft of acting, is learning how to be open to those parts of yourself that you don't necessarily identify with, but that are nevertheless in there somewhere. So, it's not like I look at the character as like a magical cloak that I put on. You know, I mean, at first you kind of think, well, that's really cool, but you realize this is just me. This is just me in a new context with maybe an accent or a different voice that I don't often use, but this is me. It's, and it's real for you as you do it because you come to think, you know, like everything is just me reacting to the set of circumstances that this character finds himself in, and it just so happens that my voice fits what the director thinks ought to work. So I'm related to every character I've ever played, like deeply. I can't think of any character that, that I've not been able to, to sort of connect with. Because one, it's my job. And if I'm ever working on a show, I've been asked before if I've ever worked on something I hate. And I'm like, mm, no, never. Because I mean, that's not, if I hate it, then I'm doing my job badly. You know, like it's, I'm an actor. If, if, I, if I can't find something about the character or the story or the really process I'm doing to, to get me through it, even if, I mean, I've frequently worked on shows that I am not the audience for, but then I'm an actor. It's my job to make sure that the audience it is for gets a good story. Uh, so I, I connect with every single character, and that's with a great part about it. It's just me. It's just me. Oh, I'm just me. It's, it's, it's um, Sandy Meisner, an acting teacher who I consider like my biggest inspiration, uh, famously defined acting as living truthfully in imaginary circumstances, uh, which I think is a great way to find it because I just find I want acting is like just to kind of put yourself in someone else's skin for a little while to try to you know be someone else because that's that's the appeal of acting originally especially when you're young is you just want to act you just rather be anybody than who you are so you, you know I don't want to play this character just so I can forgive myself for a few hours or a few days or whatever time I have for the show and you learn like at the end of a Scooby Doo episode oh, it was me all along <laughs> so it's really rewarding I just I, that's that's how I look at it and I look at the, the way I relate to characters even like I said earlier Ralph the, the guard A from you know Conqueror Shambhala like who seriously just said freeze ah! like I had a moment with that I was like oh man he's dead now <laughs> like, it's, I get I get really wrapped up in it because they are I'm just tapping into things of my own I just the the, the the biggest thing about acting that, that makes it possible, I think, is, is one's willingness to just open up. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, it's just the willingness to open up and let yourself be vulnerable to facets of your own personality that you don't identify with. You may look at a character and be like, oh, I hate that guy. I don't even, like, I would not, I would not want to sit across the table from them. Like, I hate that person, but they're in you somewhere. Like, somewhere inside of you are, is what made this person who they are in your perception. And so you can get to that and you kind of make this uneasy truth. Well, we're all human, we're all connected. So even though I'm not actually a demon who wants to eat someone's soul, <laughs> somewhere inside of me is that same impulse that everyone shares. Like, somewhere inside of me is a Sebastian. Somewhere inside of me is a Kyoya, even though I've never been a rich kid or that suave. Um, you know, somewhere inside of me, these things, and I'm like, wow, that's, and it's, acting is just like getting past all the BS that you tell yourself about who you are, so that you can let the character come in and make a home in you. I just got really deep for a second, I'm sorry. But that's <laughs> what I feel about that. Thank you. Now we'll go to you, you had a question. Okay. This might seem like a really personal question, you know, but... You're standing up, I'm a little frightened. <laughs> Do you like pineapple on pizza? <gasps> <gasps> In the time we're living in now, I'm surprised that that gets a reaction right now. Like the world's falling apart at the seams, but pineapple on pizza. God, we're going to hell in a handbasket, guys. Pineapple on pizza. Anything else is fine, but that, too far. That's too far. Um, I love pineapple on pizza. 
I have one pizza. It's not a favorite, but I'm not like, oh, take off my who dares to find out about my pizza. I mean, pizza is like, not even really a food. It's more like a genre. It's more like a, it's like a vehicle for food. It's like pancakes for a vehicle for syrup. <laughs> People say, oh, I love pancakes. Liar, you like syrup. <laughs> you like, oh, I love cocktails. Wrong! You can like fruity things that get you drunk. <laughs> I understand that. But yeah, that's fine. Is that a big issue? Like, is that, is that something that you don't talk about at Thanksgiving with the family? You can talk religion and politics, but not pineapple and pizza. <laughs> no, no. Like, we just own my uncle for that. That's hysterical. Here we go, Hawaii. You learn. Certain foods, you're like, oh, that's a big deal over here, spam. Spam is a big deal. That's like, here, yeah, here's spam. It's like, it's like almost sacred. <laughs> and you're like, it's spam. <laughs> like Indiana Jones, I mean, eat the food, like, just eat it. It's like, a, it's really a lot to these people. That's <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I guess, I don't know. Well, for, any, well, for anyone who doesn't like pineapple on pizza, your children will never survive the tropical summers. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so that should be part of our new survival as For the purple bottle. Hi again. That's a statement. You okay, hi. I actually have two questions. I will answer half of each. First off, what would you do with a magic potato? <laughs> In what way is it magical? Like, the magical pass through your mouth. <laughs> style um, with little cutaways to us going, well, you know what I thought about that. And it's super funny. John Christie uh, wrote and directed it, and uh, we actually filmed some of it in Sack Anime uh, last year. And which, so like we got the audience involved. So there was a scene with a panel where Jeremy and I, who were total rivals in the show, like we hate each other in the show, but we end up having a fist fight at the end of the episode. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, the first two episodes are up on YouTube. Just type in CON, like C O E M, all caps, professionals, and episode one, two, uh, and you'll see some really nice stuff. And some surprise guests show up. Because, you know, we're not just going to that. Uh, you, the white fedora. Yeah, uh, I use an Sebastian lines yet. Have I done my Sebastian lines yet? Did you get your late? I should have done my Sebastian lines. Okay, I'll do my Sebastian lines. Okay. Sebastian. <laughs> you sound like Mr. Darcy. Um, 
But you know, yeah, I would kind of arrange it like, you know, I, I, you know we, we seem to belong well. You know, I, I think mean, consider maybe joining my family could use you, and you know, uh, your family could certainly use us. <laughs> you know, okay. I mean, that's how I would put it. It wouldn't be like, I love you, just you know. <laughs> He's like, he's not that kind of person. He's like, no, 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 no,
I really, I, I do. I may have one of those. Okay, so getting back to Science Gate, right, it was hugely emotional experience for me because I got to write along with Patrick Sides and be the, the lead, and there's just a great cast, and the, the, the Colin Klinger, the show's director, was wonderful, like, it was one of the proudest things I've ever gotten to be part of. And uh, several years later, uh, they finally came out with the film, which was uh, its own thing. It was like a continuation of the series. It wasn't like a recap or, or something. It wasn't like a cash grab. It was an honest addition to the canon, and it was beautifully done. And it focused more on, on Christina, Kurosu, excuse me, Kurosu. And uh, it was brilliant, and I got to write it, uh, and then be in it, and I just, oh, it was so good to revisit that territory. Uh, also, so much of my life has changed. When I was writing and uh, uh, voicing Open Bay, well, six years ago now, very different time in my life. Very different time. Dark time in some ways. <laughs> um, but now, like, things are better, so I'm like, getting to revisit this. True story, so my partner, Brandon, um, who, uh, everyone oh. <laughs> did, did you not know? Or like, oh. Too. I get it. Uh, uh, so he lived in Japan for a while. He, he's fluent. Uh, that's how we met, actually. We met at the concert and he was, he was interpreting and didn't know who I was because he always watched Japanese. And I'm like, we're going to get along. Um, but uh, but he's, he's really, he lived in Akihabara, which is where the show takes place. And he would watch it when, uh, you know, like, oh my god, I know that building. That, these are all real locations that they use that they just, you know, animated. But these are real places. And there's a scene like when they're on the stairwell. He's like, I know that stairwell. That's the stairwell from like this building to this building. I use it all the time. It's right out of the K-Book store. And I'm like, oh my god, so it has a, a weird resonance for me because it, that, that show helped me work through a lot of things in my own head that, that you know helped me. Uh, and, and then Brandon, like the fact that he was living in Akihabara at the time when I was writing that, and he come back, oh my god, like, this is like, it's weird. So the show really kind of uh, just sort of played a role in my life I never expected it to. So getting to revisit it in the movie, which just happens to also be awesome, uh, it was great. It was a great way to kind of not necessarily wrap it up because I don't want it to be over, uh, even though it might be for all I know. But it was just really great to kind of revisit and be like, oh, it's like scrapbooking. I had a wonderful, but really interesting, dazzling period of my life, and knowing that like there was reality there, like oh, these are these are things I was actually going through at the time, and Brandon was actually living here at the time, and just really you don't get that chance very often. Besides um, the movies, the movies, the movies, the movies. Free. Uh, do you have any interesting pet experiences, such as with Cthulhu the octopus? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had that experience with Cthulhu the octopus. Chewy, his name was. Uh, I have a French bulldog now who loves to fart. <laughs> I mean, fart. You know, it's adorable. It smells horrible. <laughs> Because he's freaking he's phallic, so they have they take in a lot of air when they're when they're just you know eating. It's like, and it comes come out somewhere, and it comes out and it brings a lot of foulness with it. But the sound is adorable. It's like little I'm like, oh. Uh, he also just like he's a funny dog. I love French bulldogs, and I finally have one after years of wanting one. Uh, can't do cats anymore because Brandon's allergic. Sadly, though I love cats, and um, I know. <laughs> Sorry to break your heart. But, uh, yeah, I don't really have uh, the, the octopus story is the, the weirdest one I've ever done, and I'll, I'll let I'll let you guys look that up. It's a long story. Uh, the guy, the red hair guy, is a whole different thing. You're French from Italia. Which nation do you want to be with a baguette? Which nation do I want to be with a baguette? Is that a euphemism? <laughs> Probably America. <laughs> that may just be me talking, I'm not sure if that's uh, hey, uh, America, because America, you know, would eat it probably. <laughs> uh, yeah. Who would you, which country would you be with back at? England. Aw, oh, see, I've been there now. You're too nice. <laughs> it was just taking a bit. Oh, that's true. I'm going to do it. What, what? Can, you, can you give me a hit? Can you throw it? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, can you bring that in? Pass it. Pass it. Pass it down. Aww. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This is really cool. Is this is this Harvey or is this the one? It's from Nietzsche Joe. Is that the new one? Is that the uh what is it? Nietzsche Joe? Oh my god, I'm having a moment. I'm having a single thing. Did I play a girl and not remember? It? It's quite possible that happened. What show is that? Okay, describe it to me. What happens? Was I in it? You're like, no. <laughs> oh, I shall have to watch it now. I wonder why they didn't cast me. <laughs> You're really talented, by the way. Thank you. Is this what you do? Like, do you, you draw you an artist? I play piano. You play piano too? I play piano. Ah, I don't. <laughs> That's <laughs> related. That's awesome. You're very talented. Please keep at it. This is really awesome. I shall cherish this and watch the show. Because what you wrote down on here is how to remember what it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> In the very back row, I see pink hair and a little, like a little, yes, you just pointed to your head. Um, any notable shenanigans or bloopers while you're voice acting? Yeah. <laughs> Lots. Um, so I'm really fast in the booth now after doing this for so long, so we have time to kind of mess around and leave bombs for each other. And not, like, little bombs. <laughs> like, like, bombs are so big. Let's say, let's say, like, Todd and I are recording Italian again. This is actually a true story. And uh, let's say that it's a scene where France has a line to say, and it's a long line, and then, but Todd isn't recorded yet, and his character is supposed to respond to what France says. So I know when Todd comes in later, he'll hear what I put in the mouth and have to respond to it, even though it's not what he's expecting because he's got the script. He's like, well, that's not what Taylor should be saying. We all do this to each other, especially if we've known each other forever. We'll, we'll like be like, hey, Todd, let's cool it up. Good luck, you know, whatever. <laughs> There's a scene in, I think it's Italian season three, where France is telling you to gossip to me about the girls and the bees. And he's like, well, two people love each other. And it's like straight up like 10 seconds of beep. <laughs> well, the beep was in the Japanese, but we don't like, we're not gonna put the beep in there until post. So whatever I say, Todd will hear. <laughs> Response. And I cannot tell you what I said. Not at this pen, anyway. Um, but I can tell you that I would, because literally, Jamie, a Marky, my dear friend, wrote the scripts, and, and she just kind of, she just put ad lib and beep, and then in the, in, the, uh, in the director's notes column, for me, she was like, Taylor, just make Todd really uncomfortable. <laughs> you have 10 seconds to make him super uncomfortable because they're not, the beep will be in post. I'm like, <laughs> So I, I was like, well, two people love each other, and la 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 which 10 seconds is, is an eternity in the booth, especially for a show as manic and energetic and, and with the rhythm that uh, Italia has. So I won't say what I said, but I will say I know it must have hit home because when Todd was in recording like a week later, I ran into him and he's like, hey, Tatum. <laughs> So I found out that you're the voice of Acnologia from Fairy Tale. Yep. How does, it, how does it feel to voice a very big, powerful enemy dragon? It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. I got to see. I I I can be downplaying it. Like I got to go in. Like Fairy Tale. Can we just discuss my, my role in Fairy Tale? Please, I mean, I've, done, I've done a couple things for Fairy Tale, and at some point I played Simon, right? The guy with the correct metal jaw. Really cool, noble character. Really like yeah. playing him. And then I was like, you know, there was that was all, and I'm like, this show is like. Been running for five years and you give me like one. Oh, whatever. But I was like, well, well I got to be part of it. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. And he's like, hey, you're coming back as a dragon. I'm like, oh, nice. And I walk in and I see it. I'm like, oh, this guy is so cool. So I'm very happy about that. And like the fact that he's like, I don't know, he's kind of, he's that sort of noble adversary oh, right. trope that I love to play. I actually wanted to try and get his cosplay for Akon because I saw you were coming here and I'm just like, and he's uh, dragon form? Because that's pretty complicated. I'm sure no, no, it's just his uh, human form. His human Andrew. form? Just more bad. He's got his, yeah. No, no, really. I'm, I'm a bit bad. <laughs> what? What? Sorry. Uh, yes. uh, you're like flying out of your seat for the day. Me with the cat ears in my hand. Yes. Uh, how would you feel if you were locked in a room with for four hours with every character you've ever played? Can I have the dog back? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I, I feel that way every moment of my life, actually. Like, that's part of the weird, like, sort of residue that stays with you after you've acted for, for a number of years. Like, all the characters are in here, so I do feel like I'm locked in a room with all of them. Because <laughs> it's like every character is like a new revelation about yourself. It's like, well, I didn't think I had that in me, but apparently I do. Well, this is coming to the table now. <laughs> So it's kind of it's weird, but I'm used to it. It's part of it's part of you know it's part of acting, I suppose. Yeah. Yes. Do you have a follow-up question? Yes. Yes. Do you like give them like a seat at the dinner table or something like they're part? Ah uh, no, 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 because I usually they're just here in my head, and so like I picture them in their own little context, their own little worlds, all like they're on a Skype interview, I guess, for how to describe it. And usually, it, depending on, and, and they'll come out, like, they, they're useful in day-to-day -day life from time to time. So I'll be like, oh, I'm not the kind of character that can, I'm, as a person, I don't feel comfortable, like, bitching at someone who's just done me wrong. So I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go to kill you mode, and then that's, it becomes the thing. Five minutes. I have five minutes? Thank you. All right, lightning round. <laughs> this will not work, I know, it never does. <laughs> yes. How do we ask? Yes. Uh, all the time, actually, and I continue doing that. Like, I frequently look to like all sorts of performance for for one things. I sometimes will look at like yoga techniques, things like that, because it's just I, one of the really cool things about acting is that you're kind of pulled in a thousand directions and into like emotional. I didn't know that was a thing. You might you might play a character that has a profession that you've never thought of, and then you're like, oh, I want to do a little research. I'm like, that's really cool, and you go, oh, I'm going to actually do that thing for a little while. So I I've, I've had experiences. Um, I have musical training. I was a pianist. I actually went to school with a high school pianist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I, I approach the craft very musically and I, I tend to you know, take care of my voice similarly or I, I'll, I'll, I'll hear, I'll memorize lines with a certain tone, like a certain music to it. Uh, and kind of, so yeah, they, I, there's a lot of different disciplines I've used uh, to, that I've kind of married together to approach the craft. Good question. Uh, uh, Google the red shirt kind of toward the wall. When your first year got moved, after you found out who did it, did you reconsider placing it for her to I I kept what Brina did. It was actually kind of nice. <laughs> Very fun toy now. Thanks, Brina. Uh, like the maroon in the glasses. Uh, what's the first time you did the first year? It was a noble effort. Um, <laughs> No, the food in Britain is very, very bland. Like, they don't believe in a lot of spices over there, but it's very hearty. They have breakfast like three times a day, which is going like, oh, eggs and sausage, I can do that for every meal for a while. And so I'm like, oh, okay, that's fine. But like, it was, it's not a very, here we're very spoiled because we have so many different influences, especially coming from like uh, Southern, you know, uh, the Southern American continent. Do we have, you know, spices that they don't really get over there, they don't, that they're not accustomed to. So it's, it's pretty bland. But they do certain things really well. They do desserts really well, uh, and they do like like meats, like sausages, and like like shepherd's pie. I'm mean, very fond of shepherd's pie. Not so much haggis. Oh, <laughs> haggis is like meat, like eating old meat out of an old lady's purse. <laughs> uh, and you have to eat the purse. Uh, you pink hair and, and cabbage. Too bad. What would you do? What? Demon T.L. and Sebastian were in Enter the Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> that face would never have broken. <laughs> Sebastian. Um, oh god, I think they... Oh, I don't even think about that. Be, you'll become... I, I just think of... Whoa. I just imagine C.L. dressed up as the clock tower now. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, I have time for one more question. And then I have to go... Ah, uh, me, I love you all. I'm gonna go with you. Red wig, right there, in the boat. Has there ever been a time when you want to travel to a country you really want to visit, but couldn't? No. No. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, I, I used to travel. Uh, I traveled a lot when I was a kid. I used to travel with my father all over Europe and South America all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I got to know Europe a lot better than I got to know the, America, uh, uh, the United States because like, we didn't travel as much there, and now I'm seeing more of the United States in, in you know in this phase of my life than I ever did as a kid. But yeah, so I've been to England like tons of times. I've been to like Germany and Spain and all that like multiple times. So like weird little out of the way like non-touristy spots because it was from my dad's work. Belgium, yeah, I've been to Belgium. Yeah, I've been to Belgium. Uh, yeah, so I really I, I was very lucky to travel. I, I love to travel. 
So I haven't yet had the experience of not being able to go somewhere. Uh, if, I, if I'm not able to go, it's because like my schedule is keeping me here or something like that. But I feel like I've been traveling a lot, so I'm very, very happy. Travel? I don't know. I don't think I'd be the same person if I didn't travel. So, so.